Do white homeschoolers need culturally diverse resources? Let's talk about it. Hi, I am Rachel from 7 and All, and I am going to warn you in this video, I am going to bring up more questions than answers. My goal with this video is to get you started thinking, thinking about your family and how you could address some of these issues and these questions that I'm going to bring up. I'm going to start with something that I think is maybe not quite universal, but coming close to universal for parents and their desires for their children. I believe that many, many parents from all around the world, one thing that we greatly desire for our children is for them to know deeply who they are, to own who they are, to have a strong sense of identity uh, but also for from that place of identity for them to be able to connect deeply and meaningfully with people who are very very different from them and to care deeply for people who are different from them. I believe that parents, many many parents have that desire that as we raise our children we wonder how can we instill these values and this identity and help them to feel comfortable and own who they are, but to also engage well with others. We question how we can do this. And today I'm gonna to be asking, can, do, do culturally diverse resources for education, for learning, and for homeschool have a place in this quest? Could having a more colorful bookshelf be a part of this quest? Let's talk about that today. All moms worry about their kids. Now, should we worry as much as we do? Probably not, but it, it tends to be a mom thing. I, I mean, sometimes they do give us some reasons to worry. I do have this one nagging worry that can um, come to me about my own kids, which is that sometimes I wonder if because of the life choices that my husband and I have made, I wonder if because of these choices, if they will struggle when they grow up to feel like they truly belong anywhere, that they truly have a home where they are just at home, where they don't feel like they need to be on and, you know, you know how you feel at home versus how you feel outside the home? <laughs> I wonder if because of some of our choices that they won't have the same sense of belonging that other people might experience. And I'll just explain why. Like um, My husband and I, we are a cross-cultural relationship and that's all well and good. Like Everybody supports interracial marriage nowadays. Nobody questions it. <laughs> there are, I do think, some specific challenges with cross-cultural marriage um, and the dual language living that we have, but it is normal, um, but it it does create a very different um, identity for our kids and one that neither my husband nor I experienced because my kids have their Midwestern Caucasian roots. They have the casseroles that their mom makes them and they play with John Deere tractors and John Deere tractors are life because we're from, <laughs> I'm from Michigan, I'm from the farm. Um, that's a big part of their life. But then they are also Mexican and they have piñatas on their birthdays and they eat pelon with their papa and they speak Spanish. So they are also Mexican. They have both of those identities and then we add on a third layer that they are also third culture kids. We are raising, we, my husband and I are, were both born in the US but we are raising our kids in Southeast Asia. So my kids have US passports but they were born overseas and in Southeast Asia is the only home that they've ever known. So they might be from um, where my husband and I are from, but to them, home is the place where they can't leave their toys unattended at the park because the monkeys might steal them and their favorite food for breakfast involves dal and, <laughs> or curry. And um, their, their biggest fireworks holiday of the year where they know that they get to see fireworks and play with sparklers is Lunar New Year. So because of all these different layers, sometimes I do worry. I do know that third culture kids have sometimes struggled with feeling like they truly have a real home anywhere. There are some who handle it very, very well, and there are others who, who struggle in adulthood with their own upbringings um, when they've ha they have a multicultural background. And I wanna know what is the secret sauce to having kids who can have this very mixed culture background and just own it and feel comfortable and feel at home and wear it and not feel um, an outsider or not feel antagonistic 
or feel like other people don't understand them? How can you so deeply understand yourself that you end up feeling understood by those around you even when you don't fully connect with any one culture? So sometimes I worry, but worrying doesn't get us anywhere, now does it? So we need to stop worrying and start being intentional about how can we equip our children to know deeply who they are, to be equipped to engage meaningfully with others who are different from who they are. We need to be intentional in considering exactly how we will equip them to do that. I recently read a book that is actually written for parents and it was written by a homeschool mom. Now if you are new to this channel, I'm poking fun at myself. I regularly poke fun at myself because my taste in books is probably not what it should be. I am a homeschool mom, but I just don't tend to read the normal homeschool mom books. My taste in um, books that I read during my stolen moments of quiet time is more like mystery novels and adventure novels or children's books. Um, you know, I'm, I'm growing, we're all, we're all on the growing path. I, I have a quirky taste in books. Um, but I actually read a book that was for homeschool moms. This is not sponsored. This is not a partnership. I bought it myself. <laughs> um, and it was written by Amber from Heritage Mom Blog. It's called A Place to Belong and it is very recently released. And I did want to tell you about it because I actually read it. It was, it's different from the normal homeschool mom book. Um, it's not only for homeschool parents, but it is written for parents. and. I, I think it's very, very friendly to the homeschool lifestyle. She is a homeschool mom herself. Um, it's called A Place to Belong and it is very much exploring this idea of how can we intentionally create our homes and our families and our communities as a place to belong for our children so that they can have this deep sense of identity, knowing who they are in such a peaceful and strong way that they can go out into the world and they can relate on a level with others where they do not feel threatened and they don't feel unstable and they don't feel like where do I belong and struggle with this so much. So I'm recommending her book. I read it. I read a grown-up book. <laughs> I read a mom book. Um, I am recommending her book. I'm not going to spoil it. Um, I don't know if nonfiction books can have spoilers, <laughs> but that book is feeding into this conversation, but I wanted to also recommend this book, but then also talk to you about some of these questions to get you thinking in your own way and in my own way about some of my ideas related to this topic. Now reading this book hit me hard because it addresses head on some of those background worries that I have sometimes about how my boys um, will handle growing up in her unusual lifestyle. And we've already started implementing some of these suggestions that she gives in the book, the ones that are appropriate for our boys' age and our life stage. Um, to help building, building their uh, intergenerational connectedness with their family and knowing who they are. But this leads me to the question that I started off with. I strongly suspect that this desire to raise kids who know deeply who they are, raise kids who can connect deeply and honestly with others who are different from they are, I know that this is not just a need and a desire for multicultural families. I think it is a desire and a need for everyone, for parents raising kids. Amber speaks a little bit about this in her book, that there seems to be this underlying idea in Western culture that white is normal and everyone else has a flavor. Uh, that white is kind of the standard in some sense, and then there's all these different varieties that you have if you're not white. Everyone else has a culture, but then the just normal is white. Uh, and Maybe when it's stated that bluntly, it, it rings obviously false. Um, but when we're not stating it out clearly, the underlying assumption can still remain. And it is true, white people do have cultures. Um, it's, it's very true, we gotta remember we do have our own cultures. If you don't think that there's such a thing as white people food, you should ask your friends who are not white if there is white people food, because we definitely have our own foods. Um, living with my Mexican husband for many, many years, I have learned to realize that and he will revolt if I make white people food too often in too short of a time frame. You know, I just really love potatoes <laughs> and he's like, this is not food. <laughs> so we do have our own cultures. There isn't just white people standard and everyone else has a flavor. It, that's, that can be this underlying false 
realities, alternate reality, um, but we need to engage with what's the truth. Everybody is coming into life with their own culture. Every family has their own unique culture and then wider uh, communities, heritage communities have cultural um, ways as well. But you see this normal versus cultural idea very much in the homeschool influencing world because everybody who is sharing diverse resources has some reason for doing so because these are the resources that fit with their family. You'll see me sharing Hispanic um, books that feature Hispanic kids or books that are in the Spanish language because our family speaks Spanish. Uh, so you'll see different influencers sharing diverse resources, but it's because it's something that relates to their family and to their heritage. Or you will see everybody sharing resources that fit a certain community when it's that community's special month, when it's uh, Hispanic Heritage Month. Um, when it's these different months, you'll see people sharing the resources that fit that month. So people are sharing diverse resources, but it's always with a specific reason to do so. It's not just part of like, this is just life. You know, we have normal and we have flavors, and that's what we're trying to get away from. It's, it's not stated this way, but there does seem to be some underlying idea that Little House and Mark Twain and all the classics of Western literature are good enough for all the white homeschoolers, but then it's also understandable that the black and brown and every other community of homeschoolers, that they would want to add in some books that fit their community as well. So then we, who have no personal connection to other cultures, will read Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry, and we'll read When the Mountain Meets the Moon, and we'll read Esperanza Rising, and then we've met our quota of other flavors and we can go back to normal. Let's work against this idea. Let's say that human history in all its diversity and human modernity in all its diversity is worth knowing. Sometimes, and I'm speaking to the world of Christian homeschoolers here because that's what I am. Sometimes it seems like within Christian homeschool we can be more concerned with making sure that none of the books on our shelves mention a world that's millions of years old, but we're not very concerned with making sure that our bookshelves have some semblance of representation of every tongue and every tribe and every nation. We can do both, you know. We can teach our kids that God is the creator of the world and we can teach them about the vast variety of people he created and we can teach them that they are worth knowing. I hope that these thoughts and that these questions are enough to get you started contemplating the cross-cultural conversations, the cross-cultural relationships that are happening within your own family and your own community. I hope that it's enough to get you started looking at your bookshelves and considering is it only the classics that are worth investing in? Are we only buying that full set of Sherlock Holmes? Because of course we have to have that. But then all the diverse and colorful books, well, we'll just borrow those from the library because we only need them for a few weeks. If this topic resonates with you, I hope that you will um, read A Place to Belong for yourself. But I want to leave you with a short story, something that it's just one tiny example, but it's something that I think is an example of what we are hoping for for our kids when they grow up. Now, obviously, one little story does not encompass the whole of this knowledge of your own identity in such a way that you can engage well with people who don't share um, your community. But this is an example. This is just an example I thought was a really good example of it, a story that I thought was a really good example. And this is a story of my sister when it was her freshman year of college and she was taking an art history class. She's an art major, she loves art, it's a huge passion for her. In her art history class, they were studying about art as used in world religions throughout history. And the assignment that her professor gave was for the students to create a god, to create an artistic form, representation of a god. And you had to design it yourself, design what this god is, what it does, you know, design your art god. Now, um, my sister is a Christian believer, so uh, obviously, to her, obviously, she could not do this assignment. We believe in one almighty creator God, and we do not make images of our God. And we, yeah, we don't make them in any case, we definitely do not make them for college class assignments. Now, her response to this was not, Ah, I'm being persecuted because I'm a believer in Jesus. I'm being oppressed. My rights are being taken away. That was not her response. Her response was, I know I'm not going to do this. I cannot do this. 
But she went beyond that in her thinking and she thought about, it's not just me as a believer in Jesus that actually this assignment is not appropriate for. Several other world religions, in several other world religions, in Islam, in Judaism, it is not acceptable to make an image of God. Uh, in other world religions that do practice worship of images, it, like Hinduism, it just feels incredibly disrespectful to turn something that is a core part of people's faith, a core part of how they live, into a flippant college class assignment that has no actual religious meaning, <laughs> into a creative art project. Worship of images is not an art project. And so she realized that it's not, it, it wasn't just about her. She realized obviously how this affected her, but she was able to go beyond that because she knows, she has lived with, she has walked with people who practice these other religions, who practice other religions that don't make images of God and who practice religions that they do worship images of multiple gods. So she knew instantly and deeply how this assignment affected other people. And so she actually uh, spoke to her professor and she brought up all these ideas. She asked first of all for an alternate assignment for herself, but then she also asked him to consider this assignment and brought up the reasons of how many different people of faith, for many different people of faith, this just, this just wasn't, didn't feel right. This didn't feel right in when we're trying to respect the religions that people believe around the world. This, this is just not something that many people of faith could do. And the response of her professor was to say, you know, wow, I never thought of it in that light at all. This was just something I thought would be a fun assignment. And he didn't realize how it would affect, you know, these other perspectives. He listened to her very gracious and well thought out responses and he had a gracious response himself of actually I am going to change my syllabus. I'm going to change that assignment not only for you but for the entire class and he was able to understand why and connect with her explanation of it. So this is what, this is just a tiny example of what I think we are hoping for um, in, this, in this goal. That this tiny example of my sister knew who she was. She knew what she believed about faith, about God. She knew what she could do with art and what she couldn't according to what she believed. But she also knew it just it wasn't just about her. This isn't just something that would affect her. This could affect other students of other religions taking this class. And so she spoke up for them, for communities that are different from what she believes as well. So that's the story I want to leave you with and get you thinking about. It's like how can we create this deep feeling of belonging in our kids and what role do diverse cross-cultural international um, resources and classes and tools play in this intentional process. All right, I'll be seeing you next time.